Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, today we're going to try to estimate the number of electrons promoted into the conduction band from the valence band at any given temperature T uh, so that we can sort of get a, uh, an idea of uh, the conductivity of a particular uh, semiconductor and how it um, changes with temperature. We said before that we would expect um, the semiconductor to get more and more conductive as the temperature is raised. But today we want to uh, quantify that statement. Uh, and so um, that's sort of the objective of this lecture. So here's where we left off uh, last time. Uh, we said that we have this um, conduction band up here and this valence band down here at temperature um, of zero Kelvin, uh, the valence band is completely filled and the conduction band is completely empty. We also have uh, an E sub G, a gap energy between them. Okay, and so um, the, uh, this picture here basically plots the Fermi Dirac distribution to the right, as we said, and uh, this uh, F of E is basically the probability density. Right, and therefore it ranges from zero to one. Okay, and so um, a state here, down here in the uh, valence band, okay, down here is uh, very much, is very likely to be occupied by an electron and, and therefore the, uh, the F of E is very close to one. And at temperature equals to uh, zero Kelvin, it would be exactly identically one uh, these states up here are all empty, no electrons there. And so the probability of those states being occupied is zero, right? And so we have to sort of transition from one to zero somewhere within the band gap. And we said that the Fermi energy uh, at low temperatures is basically right in between, uh, right smack in the middle of the band gap. And so we see that um, the Fermi Dirac distribution is basically one all the way up to the Fermi energy and then drops to zero from there. Okay, and so uh, at non-zero temperatures, we get uh, a little bit of a more uh, smoother transition from one to zero, right? We start decreasing a little bit from away from one, all right? And then uh, we get this sort of this green curve that also go, gets you from one to zero. Okay, so this is of course uh, the probability density, but uh, if we wanted to know how many electrons uh, at a non-zero temperature make it up into the conduction band, uh, well, it is related to these probabilities, okay, uh, which are non-zero on the green curve, but it's not directly, um, obtainable from just this graph here. We said we had to also consider how many states there are at the various energies, right? So we need the electron population density N of E instead of F of E. So that was where we left off. We decided that we needed to sort of transition away from F of E and towards this population density N of E. Okay, so, uh, so that's where we're going to continue, okay? The uh, population density though is related to uh, the Fermi Dirac distribution. We have to sort of multiply, as we said, the density of states Z of E um, by the Fermi Dirac distribution F of E to get the number of electrons. So this is the, the density of states and this is the probability that a, a given state is occupied. When you multiply them together, we get honest to goodness electrons. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, the Z of E earlier we said was given by a formula we, that we had actually derived rigorously. Uh, here we're assuming that uh, we're dealing with three electrons in order to get this nice closed form mathematical solution. Right, so we have this nice uh, formula for a Z of E and uh, F of E is what we said before, right? Namely, this uh, one over uh, E to the uh, delta E over KT plus one, right? So that is the standard form. Um, 
but we're going to, uh, since it's a, it's a little bit unwieldy, okay, it's not a, the easiest of all forms, we're gonna to try to uh, make use of, a, of an approximation. Okay, we're gonna make use of an approximation and that approximation uh, is valid because of the following situation. We have basically that this energy difference, okay, and here, the energy here refers to states in the conduction band. So this is not an arbitrary energy E where we're pointing to states in the conduction band. And so uh, the conduction band basically starts at an energy of zero. That's where we sort of drew the zero energy line. Okay, and so uh, this, this here is gonna be greater than zero minus E sub F because zero is the lowest state in the conduction band. Right, and so uh, the uh, the Fermi energy though is minus E g over two, and so we we end up with this uh, difference here that appears in the Fermi Dirac distribution. That difference here is definitely going to be larger than E sub g over two, but E sub g over two is going to also itself be larger than k times t, where t, when t is evaluated. Um, uh, well, when T is the room temperature, namely 300 Kelvin, okay? We said that this here is on the order of a 40th of an electron volt, whereas this year, um, EG over two is about a half of an electron volt, at least for silicon. Uh, and so yes, a half is bigger than a 40th uh, and quite a bit bigger. All right, so the upshot though is that uh, the starting point is bigger than the ending point here, right? So this, this difference is larger than KT at room temperature. And so therefore we can, we're allowed to uh, approximate uh, F of E by an exponential decay function. That's what we said, right? So it, uh, F of E can be approximately written uh, like, like this. This is because we can sort of ignore um, the plus one in the denominator. Okay, so that makes it a lot easier. Okay, this is, this is a lot easier to deal with. Okay, so now uh, let's, um, let's do it. Uh, we, we wanna find the number of electrons in the conduction band. We're gonna call it N star. Okay, so that's the meaning of N star. And so we basically, we said we had to integrate uh, this, um, population density uh, with respect to energy. And we're gonna start from the bottom of the conduction band and go to the, basically the top of the conduction band, but here we're just gonna to go to infinity. All right, and so we're gonna have this integral to evaluate. We plug in what we know for the, for N of E, and now we're gonna plug in furthermore, what we know for Z of E and F of E using the approximation for F of E, right? And so when we, uh, put it all together, we get an expression like this, right? So this here comes from um, the density of states, Z of E. There's a whole bunch of constants that we can pull outside of the integral that also come from Z of V. okay? And then we have this term here that we get from F of E, the approximation for F of E. All right, so, um, we can pull one more factor out, namely this factor here outside of the integral because E sub F is also a constant and therefore this entire thing is a constant. What we're left with is just this integral here. It doesn't look too complicated now, right? So we need to examine that definite integral, but uh, one thing we can do is um, sort of sift through our table of integrals. Uh, at least that's what we, used to do uh, when I was in college. We'd have to then pull out our table of integrals and see if we can find one that kind of looks like this. Nowadays, you might uh, simply run to Mathematica, which is fine too. Okay, but in my table of integrals, uh, uh, in any case, uh, I was able to find this definite integral already evaluated for me. Okay, and this definite integral looks very much like this definite integral all we have to do is a change of variables, right? So this x, this x here would have to be replaced by e over kt. So we do this change of variables. And so therefore then we can 
immediately or very quickly see that uh, the integral evaluates to, to this expression here. So the square root of pi is still there. Okay, and I, I, I'm getting this KT stuff uh, because I had to um, do a change in variables. Okay, so uh, with that, we can then write down an expression for uh, the number of electrons in the conduction band at any given temperature T. And that is what we get. Okay, um, so and simplify this just slightly, putting all the constants together and uh, we end up with, with this expression here. And we're gonna do one more thing, namely just divide by volume. Okay, and then we get an expression for the number density of electrons in the conduction band. Right, so this is now the number of conduction band electrons per unit volume. So I've basically just taken this and divided by V. All right, and so now the V is gone. And uh, finally, what we're gonna do is, uh, we're gonna think about this mass here that appears in this formula. What kind of mass is that? Well, maybe intuitively we would expect this to be the electron mass. Okay, and it's certainly related. It's the mass of the electron, but now we have two notions of mass of the electron. There is the free electron mass, M0, and then there is the effective mass. And uh, here we have to um, use the effective mass for the electron, right? So M here in the previous formula should really be thought of as the effective mass for the electron. And that of course depends on the band curvature, as we said, okay? <clears throat> and therefore it depends on the material you're looking at but we can write this uh, effective mass in terms of the ratio here times uh, the, free, the free electron mass. I mean, you just cancel it out and you see that that's true. And so we're plugging this now into the previous formula and now we get our final form, okay? Namely, we get this formula, right? So here now we're gonna refer to the free electron mass because it's just easier it's easy to find that in a table. It doesn't depend on the, uh, uh, the material, the semiconductor that you're looking at or the band. Um, so this M naught is now constant, but now it comes at the expense of this additional factor that we get, right? So of course, if I combine this M naught with this ratio here, I would end up with the formula we just had on the previous page. Okay, so uh, what we see here is we, we get a bunch of constants, although the T should not be considered a constant. We're gonna pull, the, pull that out. Actually, that T shouldn't even be there because I've already pulled it out, so that's a mistake. Let me just quickly uh, fix that. Okay, so uh, magically fixed. Okay, so there, um, that T was actually pulled out uh, out front. Okay, and so then uh, we really do have just a bunch of constants that we can evaluate times this mass ratio to the three halves power times the two factors that depend on temperature, right? So here we get the T dependence there. So when we uh, evaluate uh, the constants, um, you know, by just plugging in all the individual constants, we get 4.84 times uh, 10 to the 15th per cubic centimeter. Okay, so uh, this formula here is, is uh, a useful formula uh, because um, the constant has already been evaluated, right? So uh, the way to interpret this formula though is that the result will be in um, numbers of electrons per cubic centimeter if the temperature here is in Kelvin. Okay, so if I plug in a, a temperature in Kelvin, then that is what I'll get. I mean, if you don't like that approach, you can just say that this constant here really has units of one over cubic centimeters over Kelvin to the three halves power. Okay, so this here then is equation 8.9 in our textbook on page 120. And it's actually a fairly useful formula uh, that can be used quite quickly First though, uh, and we're gonna look at an example here in a second, but first 
note that the temperature dependence is, as we said, right here, okay, but that the dominant factor, the dominant uh, sort of factor um, that determines the temperature dependence is the exponential. So this, uh, this, uh, this thing that I've uh, circled here is really, um, is, is really what um, determines the temperature dependence for the most part. This is sort of a slight correction. Okay, so when temperature, of course, is a zero or, or goes to zero, if you will, if temperature becomes very, very low, close to zero, then of course this exponential here, well, this exponent here blows up and I get e to the negative, a very, very large number, which is then basically zero. Okay, and so it has the right temperature dependence uh, in that if I lower the temperature, then the number density of conduction electrons is going to be uh, approaching zero. So uh, there we go. Now, now that we have um, uh, the, uh, a formula for N of E, the electrons in the conduction band, what is uh, the number density of holes in the valence band, you might ask, okay? And the answer is, well, they must be the same, right? For every electron that is promoted uh, thermally to the conduction band, it leaves behind a hole in the valence band. So we also now have an expression for N sub H, the number density of holes. Okay. So uh, the formula that we just derived is, is useful. We can look at an example, say silicon, at room temperature, say 300 Kelvin, okay? And we at 300 Kelvin, we have a band gap of a, about 1.12 electron volts, okay? Uh, at at um, absolute zero temperature, uh, the band gap is just slightly larger at 1.17 uh, electron volts. So there's a slight dependence, uh, temperature dependence of the band gap, but it's, it's very slight and so, uh, for most, uh, for most um, purposes, we, we can just consider it to be a constant. So here we're gonna use the value 1.12 electron volts and then we plug it all in and we get um, 9.8 times 10 to the ninth uh, electrons uh, per cubic centimeter. So this is basically 10 to the 10th, right? 10 to the 10th uh, per cubic centimeter. Okay. Now, what is the atomic uh, number density for silicon? Well, if you either look that up or use that formula in the book to compute it, you get five times 10 to the 22nd per cubic centimeter. Okay, so that's quite a bit larger. As a matter of fact, if you form the ratio here, right, you get something like five times 10 to the 12th. Okay, and furthermore, each atom contributes four valence electrons for silicon. Right, there's the, the two s orbital electrons, the two p, uh, two p orbital electrons. There's four valence electrons. And so um, how many valence electrons do I get overall? Well, it's gotta be four times that. So um, uh, two times 10 to the 23rd valence electrons. So I'm just multiplying this here by four. And so uh, quite a few valence electrons, but we only get 10 to the 10 of them in the conduction band. So 10 to the 10 as, a, as an absolute number seems large, but as a relative number is of course very, very small, right? Because we only get one in about 20 trillion electrons uh, making it into the conduction band. So if you have 20, there's a single electron for every 20 trillion electrons. <laughs> Uh, that manages to jump up into the conduction bed. So a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction, you know, this, this one electron is, or those, those electrons, those 10 to the 10 electrons in the conduction band are sort of extremely privileged, right? They're, they're a tiny fraction. All right. So now that we have those numbers, uh, we can use it to calculate uh, uh, conductivity. We can almost predict here using this formula what the conductivity of a semiconductor should be. 
Okay, and so just to remind you here, um, the uh, connectivity uh, comes from, from J, right? The current density. And we have a formula for current density, NAV, but here we have two types of charge carriers. We have the negatively charged electrons in the conduction band and the positively charged holes in the valence band. When I put it together, I get some, uh, some expression like this. Now, um, these two velocities are opposite to one another. So they actually, this, this, this um, uh, difference here is actually a fairly large number. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't evaluate to zero. It, it actually evaluates to a um, fairly large number. So, um, so that is an expression, but it's not the most common way of writing the current density. Uh, so uh, we're going to now introduce a new quantity that we haven't encountered before. So we're, this is actually new, but common, common, but new to us, okay. Uh, we, we're going to introduce this quantity called mobility and we're gonna give it the symbol mu. All right, so how is it defined? It's actually a very straightforward, very simple definition. It is just uh, the drift velocity V over the electric field. So that ratio we're gonna call mobility. So given a certain uh, strength of the electric field, what is the resultant drift velocity of the charge carriers? Okay, if it's uh, large for a certain electric field value, then we have a very large mobility. If it's a small drift velocity for a given electric field, we have a small uh, mobility, all right? And so using this mobility now, we can write uh, the conductivity in a new way. So here, first off, is what uh, sort of defines the conductivity, namely the conductivity comes out of Ohm's law, right, the sigma. So uh, we can write uh, sigma times E being the current density is also NEV, and therefore sigma is equal to NEV over um, the, uh, uh, the electric field. Okay, one change in notation I'm, I just discovered I should be making is the electric field should really be um, denoted by the script epsilon, right? Before we were using the regular capital E for the electric field, but we decided maybe just for notational clarity to use a script E. And so I wanna continue uh, with the script E here. So this should be J is equal to sigma times script E. All right, and so then of course, uh, solving this for sigma gives us NEV over the electric field. Okay, and um, we can write it um, like this, V over the electric field. Okay, but that is, isn't that, that's exactly what we introduced just now as mobility. And so we can write it like, like this, NE mu. Okay, so uh, the current density is NEV, but the conductivity itself is NE mu. <laughs> two formulas that look very similar, uh, okay, but um, we have to keep them separate. All right, and so then we have, if we have two um, types of charge carriers, we get basically this twice, right? We get it for the electron and we get it for the hole. Okay, so we get this nice formula for the conductivity, N times E here, um, absolute value. So this is really now a plus 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs times the sum of the individual mobilities. Okay. All right. Now the mobilities of electrons and holes uh, can be looked up for various semiconductors. Uh, and we have standard tables that sort of tabulate these numbers. And so that's why this formula for conductivity is actually a useful one because the mobilities um, are actually tabulated. Okay, and so now we can put everything together. We have um, the uh, number densities, right? Given by, uh, by this, and then we multiply that by uh, 
the absolute magnitude of E times the sum of the mobilities, right? So this formula comes directly from, from here where we also now substitute what we uh, know for um, the charge carrier number densities, the, the little n. These, of course, these little n refer to the conduction electrons, the number density of the conduction electrons, or the number density of holes, which is, of course, the same number. Okay, so uh, we get then this equation here, um, and basically, uh, fairly easy to, to, to use. We would have to look up these mobilities and plug it in here. But other than that, a fairly straightforward um, formula to use. So this is equation 8.14 in our textbooks, textbook on page 121. Okay, I'm gonna stop here and pick it up there next time. Thank you.